very glad to have Sima here um, to present uh, the one, I think the, I believe the one non-RCT and, and one of the two projects that were not part of the original PO1, but a fascinating paper. Terrific, thanks for uh, the invitation to present at the conference. And, uh, as Esther said, this is paper is going to be a little bit different in nature. It's not an RCT, though it's certainly about uh, child health. And uh, it's also going to be a little bit different in that part of it is going to be very descriptive. And then there's a more technical part. So, uh, But that's the new part that we're excited about, so interested in hearing feedback. And I'll try to give the intuition for what that part is about. So this is with Rohini Pandey, who's, who's sitting over there, and uh, Tomas Strelecki, who is at Harvard but is out of town right now. So the title of the paper is, Why are Indian Children Shorter Than African Children? And just to give you sort of some more background on this paper, we've started this paper a while ago as an empirical paper. And we kind of uncovered a fact that we didn't set out to, to look for. We, we uncovered it, stumbled up across it. And then a lot of the paper is, we think that fact is really important. And then uh, a lot of the rest of the project is trying to come up, trying to understand why that fact uh, holds. OK, so the, the starting point for this is that children in India are short. So the, we, why do we care about height? Height is a very commonly used proxy for child malnutrition and inputs into child health very early in life. And there's a lot of evidence that uh, height is correlated with a lot of other longer term outcomes uh, that we think are important, like adult health and education and earnings. Uh, so there's a large literature on, on the importance of height, and it's been long known that Indian children are short. So there are a couple, the standard measure is using z-score, so the worldwide distribution of height for kids of your gender and age, and measuring your height in terms of the standard deviations from the mean. And on average, Indian kids under age 5 in the data set we use uh, have a, a z-score of minus 1.6, so 1.6 standard deviations below the, the worldwide median for, for their age group. So another metric that's often used is stunting that Ben alluded to, which is that's an indicator for being two or more standard deviations below the median, and 42% of Indian children are stunted. So India is a poor country. We would expect kids in poorer countries to, to be shorter because of the inputs on the disease environment and nutrition. Uh, but the puzzle, or something that's been pointed out in the academic literature and also in the policy debate in India, is that Indian kids are short relative to other uh, poor countries. So we're going to use data uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa as a comparison group, and stunting is higher in India than in Sub-Saharan Africa, even though India is richer than the typical uh, country in Sub-Saharan Africa. In Amartya Sen and Jean Drez's recent book, they also compare India to the 15 countries that are, that are poorer than uh, India that are outside of Africa, so not you know, looking beyond Africa as a comparison group. And in 12 of those countries, the child height is higher than in, in India. So here's a picture. These are the data we're going to use, which are demographic and health surveys for several African countries and then for India. So what I've plotted are the, the blue dots, or the average child height for uh, on the vertical axis for different African countries. And then the x-axis is plotting a, a, uh, your GDP per capita. So you can see that in richer countries, uh, average height is higher. And then the, the line is the fitted line for the African countries. So we understand that richer countries will have taller kids. But then the red triangles are India and then other countries in, in South Asia. And those triangles are below the regression line. So kind of for their level of GDP per capita, South Asian uh, children, and India in particular is what we're going to focus on, are short. And so one thing that's in the paper that I'm not going to show you here is that if we looked at other health metrics, India isn't a negative outlier. So it's not the case that uh, India is really good on measures of GDP and maybe other measures of social development, but it's lagging in health. Other metrics, India looks good. Child height has been this uh, outlier. So this has uh, been raised, gotten attention in India. Uh, so the soon-to-be former prime minister uh, gave a speech where he talked about child malnutrition and said that it's a, a national shame and that this is a problem that th these malnourished kids are going to grow up and be the workforce in India. And so this is a, a major problem. And you know, one thing to point out is in this 
speech where he's talking about malnutrition. This was for the launch of a new survey, or the results release of data from a new survey that was measuring child height. So kind of an important thing here is that we use height as a, as a measure of child malnutrition. You know, it, and that's largely because it's easy to measure objectively as opposed to measuring uh, nutrient intake or uh, disease environment, et cetera. OK, so what is the previous literature? So I think that, or maybe I should first kind of explain, within this national debate, I guess maybe you could guess what one of the counter arguments would be, which is maybe height is not a really good measure of malnutrition if there are just genetic differences between different, uh, different regions and different ethnicities. And so that's part of the policy debate, in, in, including in this last election, of whether uh, using child height, is there really a malnutrition problem in India? And why is that important? Because if you thought that growth was leaving behind the poor, or if you thought India hadn't focused enough on growth, you, know, you might uh, vote for one party versus, versus the other. So a lot of the literature is trying to look for environmental, uh, is this an environmental, are, is most of the explanation for variation across in height across populations, not necessarily at the individual level, but across populations, is that due to environmental causes? So there's a, a large literature in India that looks at certain factors. It's, it's correlated with, child height is correlated with the mother's status or hygiene and sanitation. So some of this is correlational evidence. Some of it's pretty good causal evidence. Um, but I don't know that anybody has come up with an explanation to kind of explain all of the, uh, the, the variation. There's another approach, which is to look at, to sort of think about this environment versus genetics of looking at catch up of, of people who were born in one, uh, in say India or another developing country, and they migrate to a richer environment. So their, their environment changes. And so that literature shows quite a bit of catch up. If you were born stunted in Bangladesh and you move to Sweden, you won't entirely catch up to uh, the kids who were born in Sweden, but you'll look a lot taller than the kids who stayed behind in Bangladesh, uh, et cetera. So the, within the kind of part of what got us interested in this was the, this counter argument that uh, has resonance in the policy debates in India that you know, maybe this is just uh, their genetic differences in height potential. Uh, so Arvind Panagriya has written a, a lot uh, citing an, an, a nat National Family Health Survey study that it's a clever idea, which is to look at wealthy people within India. And so in one National Family Health Survey report, they find that in, in that data set, the, wealth, the people from the top wealth quintile, or even less than that, the very wealthy kids, uh, are still short. And you know, the argument is that they are in a perfect disease-free environment, great nutrition, and still they're, they're short, and so maybe that's a genetic difference. There's another study, uh, a peer-reviewed study, that finds the opposite effect using a different sample where they went into South Delhi and looked at uh, rich kids, and those, they're actually at the international norms for height. So, um, you know, I think it's kind of the, if you, it's a little bit of an open question of what are the specific environmental causes and how much of this is an environment. Uh, is there a question? Sorry. Uh, OK, so what are, what are we going to do in this paper? So I said we, that uh, we're going to use 27 African demographic and health surveys and compare that to the essentially the Indian DHS. It's called the National Family Health Survey in India. Uh, and the fact I mentioned that we uh, stumbled across is that the height gap between India and Africa is entirely driven by higher parity children. So I'm going to show you pretty soon a graph that shows that firstborn kids in India are actually taller than firstborn kids in Africa. And you know, we think this is an exciting fact because I think that's hard to square with the very basic notion of, of genotypes. Uh, uh, and the, you know, that there's another implication of that is even if you were already on board with there's no genetic differences across populations, and it's all environmental factors, which I, mean, I would argue kind of most academics, I think, are already uh, convinced of that. I think this still tells us something, because these within-family differences mean that it's something about take-up of available services rather than access to service. So access to service can vary over the, you know, the, the course of, of a you know, married couple's life, but it's probably not changing that dramatically. Uh, but, and we're going to see, I'm going to show you some direct evidence of, of take up also having this birth order gradient. And so then we're going to, I'm not going to show these results, but you know, we sort of think through whether this is about differences on kind of budget constraints and prices, or is this about preference? And uh, without having, you know, we can't have a smoking gun to show that it's preferences, but I think we're going to, we sort of ruled out for ourselves thinking it could be these income effects or budget constraint 
uh, driving this, and it seems to be something that Indian families have a stronger preference for earlier born children than uh, African parents do. I should uh, mention something that's not in the slides, but there are birth order gradients everywhere. So if you looked in, the, uh, there's evidence from Sweden and Norway of IQ gradients and education inputs that firstborn kids get more inputs. And probably some of you can introspect and uh, sort of had more, more attention to your firstborn child. And you know, historically in Europe, you saw height gradients uh, in uh, height gradients by birth order. We see them in Africa too. And so the fact here is that they're just stronger in India than in other settings or specifically than in Africa. So that's the, the puzzle that uh, you know, we think it speaks to this, what is, the, is this an environmental, what are the, what's the cause of, of the Indian height gap? Uh, but we wanted to understand uh, where the, why, why this a stronger preference comes from. And so this is the new part of the paper, uh, which is gonna be, a, it's a theoretical contribution. Uh, which is, uh, we're going to present a kind of a very standard quality quantity model in economics that is, originates with Gary Becker and Robert Barrow, uh, and show that that model has an implication that hasn't been uh, noticed before, which is it generates, it implies a birth order gradient in child quality. So that's the, you know, economist term of quality, and we're going to be using it as like the inputs that contribute to, to height. Uh, so the so when, when four families that have a stronger uh, preference for quality over quantity, so the ones that have a smaller family size, smaller n, they're going to have a steeper birth order gradient in such a model. And so that offers an explanation for why would these birth order gradients be steeper in India than in Africa. There's uh, considerably lower fertility in India than in Africa. Uh, and we're also going to, you know, that can fit the data. We, you know, we were searching for an explanation, so we kind of go and then test this idea within India and see if it also holds within India that the birth order gradient is steeper in, in smaller families. So one thing that uh, you know, also plays a, a, a role, we think, in this, in this puzzle is eldest son preference. So I think probably most people believe there's son preference in India. There's, you know, in particular, a, a preference for an eldest son. So this, it's pretty straightforward to see why this would generate a gradient in investment among sons. You care more about your firstborn son than your secondborn son. It took us a while. We're going to see a birth order gradient even among girls. I think at first we thought, that's puzzling. That can't be driven by all the son preference. Uh, in a way, it, well, I think we came around to the, to the realization that it can for, through a very different mechanism, which is uh, fertility stopping rule. So if you, had a, if you wanted to have two kids and you uh, really wanted to have a son and you had a girl and then another girl, you just had a surprise that you're going to continue your fertil fertility longer than you expected. And so unless you got a windfall of money at that same time, something's got to give. And, and part of that is going to be your investment in that second born daughter. So I'll say more about that. OK, so I'm going to describe the data briefly uh, and then uh, show you this evidence on the India-Africa gap in child height by birth order, then talk through some evidence uh, uh, why we think this seems to be about preferences, uh, and then go through this a uh, very sketch a model of the quality quantity trade-off and explain why it can generate both an overall birth order gradient uh, and, and why the birth order gradient is steeper in, in India than in Africa. Okay, so the data are, many of you are probably familiar with the demographic and health surveys. So we use the most recent Indian DHS is 2005-06. So we use the period bracketing that uh, from 2004 to, to 2010. Uh, that uh, the surveys that have anthropometric data from within sub-Saharan Africa. And so that's 27 surveys in, in 25 countries, I believe. Uh, and then the sample is going to consist of children under the age of five for whom we have height data. Uh, and there are 174,000 uh, children. So the main outcome we're going to look at are these height for age uh, z-scores that I mentioned. So this is relative to a World Health Organization comprising children of the same age and months and the same gender. Uh, and I don't know the politics behind picking these countries as a re the representative sample of countries, but it's Brazil, Ghana, India, Norway, Oman, and, and the U.S. And so, I mean, one thing to note is India is in these reference groups, so that's uh, you know, sort of India would look kids would look even shorter than the national norm if had India not been had China been in that instead of India. Okay, so I uh, I can't read that. I don't know if you can read this, but the, here are some summary statistics uh, on the the sample. So. I, uh, I think the one top line to, to just highlight is that 
Indian fertility is uh, lower than African fertility, you know, even kind of adjusting for the GDP level. And it's kind of beyond the scope of what uh, we're going to talk about today of you know, why that fertility level is lower, but we're going to lean on that uh, in, sort of in, in our explanation. Uh, and then I think kind of coming down here, you can see the height for age. These scores are lower in India than in Africa. The weight is also lower than in India and Africa, uh, though in this paper we focus on height. Uh, and I'm also going to show you some things on schooling uh, and uh, where schooling is higher in, in India than in Africa. Okay, so this is the, I think like half the contribution of the paper at least, is this graph, uh, which you know, the, a big bulk of the paper is trying to kill this graph because it surprised us, and I think, but it's a pretty robust finding, which is that the, uh, there's a very steep gradient in the gap between the height of Indian kids and African kids. And in fact, if you look at this, this first set of bars, with red is India and blue is Africa, the, all these heights are negative. Both African and Indian kids, on average, are below international norms. But the Indian kids are taller than the African kids. And I'm going to show you this in regressions. That's a statistically significant difference. Indian ki firstborn kids are taller than African kids. Once you go to second births, then you start to see this Indian height gap. Uh, it's, uh, so the Indian kids are now shorter than the African kids. And when you get to third and higher births, it's even bigger. So you know, we have this graph in the paper. We can look at it going further out. For the analysis, we're going to group 3 plus because just to have more power and to show, have to show you fewer coefficients. Sorry, sorry, just to clarify, is this within household or is it just aggregate? This is, these are the raw means. And so what Rick is anticipating is that if you look in a cross-section, kids who are higher births are from bigger families. And so they're going to be different. We're going to see the same. Uh, bigger gradients with family fixed effects, so comparing siblings. And I'm going to show you that uh, in a couple slides. Can you? Oh, perfect. That's my time remaining. OK, thanks. Uh, OK, so this is just raw means, no adjustments. So what are we going to do to look at whether those are statistically significant, adjust for concerns like Rick's? We're going to, uh, it's a, still a pretty simple model. We're going to have, look at interaction terms of by birth order. The main effect alpha is going to be the height difference between Indian kids and African kids for, among first births. Uh, so as I told you, we're going to find a positive coefficient. And then this is how this gradient changes when you get to second births and, and third births. We're going to uh, have some, we find similar results without any controls, but we're going to have a control for the time that the survey was conducted, since you know, India wasn't exactly in the um, average of the, the duration of the range for Africa, we're going to have dummy variables for the child's age and month. That's mainly to improve precision. Uh, and then sometimes we'll show you, we'll use controls for household measures that are trying to capture this fact that third born kids are, born, are in bigger families, and bigger families are different in many ways. Uh, and then we're going to also put in mother fixed effects, as I mentioned. And then the standard errors are cluster. Uh, by family. So the key concern is exactly what we were just talking about, that the DHS is not asking about your completed fertility. And certainly, if you wanted to measure the kids, they're measuring young kids where fertility is not completed. And so when we see a snapshot of a, a firstborn, they could end up being in a family size of seven. But on average, you know, once you're measuring a thirdborn, we, we know that you have at least three kids. And that might put you, you know, at the median or above in, in India. Uh, and so that's a hard problem to you know, completely solve with control variables. But we take, that's one approach we take. Uh, and, but the, the nice thing we can do is that this, there are a subset of mothers have two kids in the sample who are under the age of five. And so we could look within a family at this gradient. So you know, if you, once you put in a family fixed effect, we're not going to be able to measure the intercept. But we're going to see very similar relative declines between second births and third births in India versus Africa. So you know, that suggests that, this is, that these patterns we find, you know, we can't say anything about that intercept, but it's still kind of suggestive that omitted variable bias doesn't seem to be um, affecting things too much. In that case, you're always measuring the third child at a much younger age, right? right. right. Yeah, no, so we, we, can, we put in India times child age dummies. So if the age profile were different in India than in Africa, that's not biasing it, et cetera. But yeah, no, I think that the, you know, it's. it's yeah, so mother age gets absorbed by the, um, mother age gets absorbed by the mother fixed effect. But you know, the mother age at birth is collinear with the child age. And so we could put the child age in months interacting with India. And you know, there are a kind of, there is a 
time profile. So in all poor countries, the z-scores are below zero at birth, but then they decline, and then they kind of pick up a little bit at two, three years. And so you see that pattern. In India and Africa, it's not exactly the same. And so you know, what was Ben was wondering about is that certainly once you do family fixed effects, you, you're not going to get the, the younger kid in the family who's five years, because the cutoff rule for the DHS is to only measure kids under age five. But you know, again, we can kind of sort of adjust for that. OK, so this is the basic fact. Column one, it so you said TFR is much lower in India. What is the sort of maximum age of women, or kind of if you want to take median age of women giving birth to the third child, for example, in India versus Africa? Yeah, there are yeah, as big of a differences as, uh, in terms of the yeah. So they're starting they're earlier, starting. or they have less spacing in Africa than in India. <laughs> the, uh, so they're uh, the they're continuing longer, but like the fourth and the fifth would be born later. So you know, if some, in some ways, the fact of doing three plus is stacking things against us in the sense that in Africa, a lot of those are six born, whereas in India, there are very few six borns. And so and we, you know, like again, like trust us, we, <laughs> we, like, we definitely were skeptical that like of what could be driving this. And so that uh, it doesn't seem to be maternal age or kind of this composition of three plus. OK, so this is, uh, on average, the z-scores are 11. Uh, point, point one one lower in India than in Africa, and column two is doing this without. It's the you know, regression of adjusted version of the um, of the graph I showed you, where Indian kids are taller by uh, 0.08, so that's you know like almost similar in size to the overall India gap among firstborns. And then you see once you get to secondborns, if you add those two coefficients up, Indian kids are shorter, and then that gap gets even uh, bigger with uh, the third plus. And so column three, we have a bunch of more in the paper. There are many more columns and uh, intermediate uh, adding controls, et cetera, and different subsamples. Uh, but I'm just showing you the key specifications. Column three is with mother fixed effects. So here we're putting in a dummy for uh, a sibling pair. And we're comparing. It's either a firstborn and a secondborn who were observed in the data, or a secondborn and a thirdborn. There are very few, except for multiple births, they're in a five-year range, there aren't that many cases of three kids. I was just thinking about selection. So infant mortality is higher in Africa. So the kids who survive might just be better the, off. Yeah, no, that's something that's in the, we, I cut from the slides in the interest of time. But one other reason why you might say, why are we worrying about Indian kids being short, is that it's uh, selective mortality. So Indian kids are surviving at a higher rate, and that might, uh, and so the, the ones who survive, the marginal kids are shorter. So first, I mean, there's a literature on this, and like quantitatively, it can't uh, it can't account for these differences. The there's also kind of a literature that's looking what's happened as uh, mortality has changed to the average height. And I guess in terms of what we can look here is that. Indian firstborns relative to African firstborns do better on everything, and they actually have relatively lower infant mortality. So to explain this, you would need that, oh, you know, the, the, uh, the firstborns in India are dying off at a high rate. That's why they're tall. And it's actually the flip side of that. You know, they're actually surviving, just like they're going to get more schooling. They're going to get so. Or the infant just so their firstborns are doing better, and then. Uh, the infant mortality kicks in. Exactly. To explain the first, first point, you just need the fact that India is richer. That's yeah. all. You're so you're, uh, you're saying they run out of money, some lack of foresight or something. Yeah. Or yeah. as the age goes up, infant mortality. Yeah, no, I think and so I guess is, Dean has written a lot on this. I think kind of you know maybe the quantitative exercise is the most co convincing, and just terms of forget our patterns, just like the aggregate patterns of you know could that be the explanation? Um, uh, but you know we certainly like I, I do think that's like talked about as a possible reason why this is just like an artifact of a really good thing about India, that, that uh, infant mortality is, is low. Uh, OK, so the, I'm not going to uh, show you all of these tables, but I think the fact that things are changing within families, or there's this big variation within families and outcomes, is suggesting that access to services might not be the explanation. It's something about take up of services, or I say health services, but it could be things like nutritional inputs, et cetera. Uh, we find similarly, if we look at inputs, like vaccinations or iron supplementation by a pregnant woman, uh, woman they also they fall off more steeply in India than in Africa. So the things parents are doing or mothers are doing when they're pregnant or for their young children, they're just doing less of it with 
uh, subsequent births. That's true everywhere, but it's just more true in, in India. We also see the same thing uh, with other child health outcomes like hemoglobin and diarrhea. Uh, and we see it for schooling using a, a sample of older kids. So there, you know, I think this is, like, like I said, I don't know that we came in thinking there was this stronger preference for the first uh, firstborn. But that's what we seem to uh, find across a bunch of different inputs and, and outcomes. So just very briefly, you know, one thought is that uh, we, we have a bunch of other analyses in the paper to think, could this be a biological effect? I think we came in with this view that maybe it's about mother's health being worse in India, and then successive births, it's just the, you, know, you can't take, your body can't take those subsequent births when you start out in poorer health. So we can look at, uh, in the interest of time, I want to explain how we what, what we do to look at it, but that doesn't seem to be the effect, uh, seem to be driving it. We also you know, thought, is this about different income profiles? If people can't smooth over time, maybe Indian families' income is falling over time or not increasing as fast, or mistreatment of women. I think the strongest argument that this isn't seem to be the case is that this is very much concentrated among women, not men. Uh, if we look at Indian men versus women, we don't see similar gradients for men uh, with successive births. And it's moreover, it's concentrated on pregnant women. So it's not about the health status of women over the successive births. It's about something families are doing different among uh, at the time of pregnancy uh, with successive births. So I think that rules out some of the more general things. So it's hard to you know find some smoking gun of preference, but I guess in a sense, like uh, the residual seems to be it's something about you just. Uh, want to, to uh, invest more in, in these earlier kids. So the uh, so just to I may just in the interest of time skip to this explanation based on the quantity quality model. So the uh, you know we're gonna uh, uh, one explanation we think for this fact of why Indian birth order gradients are stronger than African birth order gradients is, is related to the fact that fertility is lower. So we're gonna uh, use the quantity quality model that. Becker and Barrow uh, wrote down in the late 80s. So they wrote it as a static model, thinking you, you have all of your kids at once. Subsequent papers uh, have thought about that as a sequ sequential problem. You have your kids at different times. And people have done that, written down that sequential model to think about whether infant mortality, higher infant mortality is going to increase fertility or decrease fertility. You know, there are kind of economic forces where it could go either way. Uh, we're going to write it down sequentially to think about something else, which is uh, the birth order gradient. And you know, we're very open to feedback on whether you think this is like neat or uh, trivial, but you know, that, that model has the implication that child quality will decrease, decrease with birth order. So we think this is kind of cool because economists have long empirically documented that there are birth order gradients, but I don't know that there's an explanation among, by economists of why there are birth order gradients. You know, there's a little bit about parental time might get spread thin, but, uh, or you can, build, you can bake in a preference, but this is a, uh, we're not baking in a preference, the preference is just deriving from a quantity quality model. Just a simple budget constraint. I like parent. Like just like I have, you know, my income is fixed, and with you know one kid per capita consumption is income divided by three, and with two kids. It's but why like India two. versus Africa? But like. Oh, you mean for birth order gradients? Yeah. That, that's the point of your model. Like, yeah. No. Fine. Okay. So like. No, I think the point of the model is number two, but uh, if you thought there were total liquidity constraints, I don't think that can explain the U.S. or other places where we think there's intertemporal smoothing. But, but, but the main reason, if you think you're going to have multiple kids in the start and you can save across time, then it shouldn't... He's saying that you can't save. You should smooth across time. Yeah, but there's, there's a difference well, we in the way that people allocate budgets across the children. So, for example, in lots of places in Africa, they decide, okay, here's the budget for the children. Now, it doesn't matter how many children you have. The husband hands over to the wife all the money that there is. And then she has to kind of split it. Um, and so the more children you have, the more you have to split. And that might be different. And to the extent that one person preferences are driving in terms of fertility or driving the, the decisions, that interaction with how they're determining the budget and how fixed the budget is in the more children you have could be different across the fertility. Yeah, no, 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 any uncertainty about total family size, then you go back to the budget constraints in a matter. I think that comes through what we're going to argue about yeah. girls. If you, if, you, if you have a son preference, then the sex of the child is a shock. So that would be one of the I mean, just in terms of birth order grants, like I, you know, we see them in education, the IQ in Sweden. And so I think uh, in terms of liquidity constraints, I think you could tell some like myopia story or something that's not about, that could apply in Sweden. But I think like in a lot of settings, we, we think that you know, it's not hand to mouth. also have 
No, no, but not, not like no intertemporal smoothing. You can borrow and save. And so a budget. I presume there's lots of Swedish households that have virtually no. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. So the, so the second implication that uh, is sort of comes back to this India versus Africa is that a preference for lower fertility is gonna lead to a stronger birth order grain. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna talk through the intuition with 90% uh, of the audience is probably gonna. Uh, so the, you know, so these models have, what, what is the party quality model is? It's that you're making a choice of ch children. You have some budget constraint, and you're choosing how much to invest per child, and you're, you're also making a choice of how many children to have. And so that model is saying that you kind of, with the fixed budget, you're, you, have a, you have to make a trade-off between quantity and quality. So the, uh, I'm not going to go through the, uh, the elements of the model, but I think I can just sort of speak to the results and the intuition. Uh, I'm happy to go back if anybody wants it. So the you know, first result is that in this model, uh, you know, we sort of wipe out the discount rate and the interest rate that's not necessary, but that just sort of makes the math easier. You're going to get a decrease in quality with successive children. And so that's, it's just a very simple implication of this model because as you're making this decision over time with this utility function that has both the n number of kids you have and the quality, there's gonna, when you have your firstborn child, you have a smaller family. And so the, the optimal, the, the amount of investment that you're going to make in this child is gonna be higher. One thing I should have, important from the previous slides, is this is really a model of the early investment in the children. So think at the prenatal stage and the first uh, three months of life or first nine months of life. So that when, as you have successive kids, you're going to have a bigger family and, and the average quality you want in your children is going to be lower. And that's going to have the implication that the second child is going to get less investment than the first. So the second implication, which comes back to the India, you do. But then why don't you just save for it? Why don't you just move? No, it's about the utility you get from the, so it's about the, the so this is, it's worth, uh, uh, showing you what the, I don't know which one is this, the, um, the utility you're getting from successive children is, is going to depend on the, um, you know, you're getting flow utility at, in each period, and n is smaller in the beginning. So it's totally rational expectations. There's no uncertainty in this model I'm writing down. But as Rohini said, I think once you think about gender, there needs to be uncertainty. So the second implication, I think that the intuition uh, is a little bit more subtle, is that uh, when you have the same families that have a smaller family size, will have a steeper birth order gradient. And so why does that come about? You need some curvature, some diminishing utility from successive kids to ever have to stop. And so uh, families that have that have a, in this model, like a higher epsilon is a smaller family, but that same curvature that's going to make you want to have a smaller family size just naturally has the implication that your utility from the successive children that you did have is diminishing faster. So like we're not adding an extra parameter to this model to explain birth order gradients. It's just the same parameter that makes you stop earlier is going to make, make you have uh, less utility from the same level of quality in one kid versus the next. Clarifying question for model work. So if, if all I cared about was like, say, my kid's income at age 30, none of this would go through, right? Uh, yeah, so if you, if you didn't get utility, flow utility, early in, yeah, so exa exactly. So I think there's the, uh, yeah. yeah, 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 so that's what, so this is like a, in some ways we, we, you know, we're taking this model as written down by macroeconomists, which has this idea of flow utility, that it's not, yeah, yeah, no, but, but I, I, yes. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to tell you what we find. We can do the same thing within India. Uh, you know, this is like after, the, after we have this prediction, we can test it within India. And so within India, it, the prediction is if you had a smaller family size, you would uh, have a steeper birth order gradient, and we find that even within India. So uh, that was something we hadn't anticipated. So I'm going to not... I'm gonna uh, not talk about some preference in the interest of time. I mentioned at the beginning that some preference can generate, uh, it changes the fertility decisions. Like it, intuitively, it 
could create a birth order gradient among both boys and girls. And so I think one direction you know, we'd like feedback on is uh, whether this quality quantity model is interesting enough and we should incorporate gender and, and think about how the interplay between son preference and family size preference. Uh, but thanks a lot. I have no problem at all going through the motion of saying I love this paper because I think that's uh, actually exactly for the same reason I could take taken from the same book. I think that's uh, extremely, at the core of this paper is, a, is an extremely important fact. I'm just, I just told that slide from the paper. It's an extremely important fact that should change um, the way that we think about this particular issue of the, 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 the nutrition, the stature and by implication the nutrition. Of the of Indian children, uh, it should be um, plastered on every wall, etc. We have to think about. I think it really the fact. I'm surprised we didn't know that before, uh, and but I, I certainly didn't, and I assume uh, other people didn't either. Since and but once we knew that, we have to. We really uh, that really changes the way that we think about about the world. So that's in a sense that could I could stop the discussion there. The paper could also stop there, to be honest, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that would have been quicker. We have you know we go home. If you had to go home like now, uh, and even without seeing the other paper and without seeing the presentation, you've done you've you've done your day worth of uh, finding something out. And uh, that's that's not that frequent. So I think it's worth pausing and uh, stopping there. That's a great, great fact, and uh, that makes the job a little bit uh, boring. <laughs> uh, but there are a few other important facts and, uh, that, that come in the paper, uh, and not all, not all of them were covered in the presentation, so I have okay. maybe something, something to say. Uh, the first one is that there is a, sorry, it should, it's not weight, it's height. There is a strong correlation between maternal height and children's height, which is strong enough to undo uh, the uh, um, disadvantage of Indian kids uh, with respect to African kids. In other words, if you control in regression for mother's height, there's an India advantage of the kids. The Indian kids are tall relative to their mothers. Uh, that's not true for father. Both of these are facts. That's uh, worth pointing out. Another fact that comes in the paper is that at least part of the gap for older births of the children seem to, uh, in India relative to, uh, to Africa, seem to appear uh, in utero um, as the mothers who have more children in Asia have lower BMI and the pregnant women seem to be eating less and there is no such gradient in, in Africa. So I don't know if you understood what I'm saying, but that's uh, what I'm trying to say that there seem to be, although that's you know, descriptive, it's maybe not a smoking gun, but there seem to be pretty strong indication that part of whatever is happening is happening in utero, which also, of course, fits with a bunch of evidence we have that the in utero phase of a child's development is pretty fundamental to uh, the child's health uh, and to the adult's health, actually, uh, down the line. Some of it is not in utero, it's worth pointing out, it's not finished there. Uh, immunization, postnatal care, and, uh, and schooling have the same steeper birth order gradient in India compared to Africa. Uh, there's no quantification at this point, and I don't even know whether it's quantifiable, but we know that there, is, I mean, it's, there seem to be some of, of, some of both. Um, one thing on the gene versus environment thing, so the new in thing, as uh, Erika and uh, um, uh, other, some other people who are here, Pascaline, perfectly know well to ad nauseum, the new in thing is that it's not environment, it's not the gene, it's the, it's the expression of the genes through epigenetic. I was very surprised not to see that because that's really, uh, um, it seems to be uh, that it's something we do need to, need, need, need to account. This, this fact we have before seems to suggest that the small stature of Indian children is not due, at least not, ex is not exclusively due to genes. Uh, it has to be in part due to the environment. Uh, 
which argue against the gene hypothesis, although if the only proponent of the gene hypothesis is Arvind Panagaria, it's probably not his like, strong suit, really. It's not his, uh, his, um, his let's say, specialty. Uh, but it is relevant since he's going to be, uh, with some high probability, the, the, the chief economist of, of, in, of um, India, of the Department of Finance. Uh, at the same time, the strong correlation with the mother height does suggest there may be some inherit inheritability, uh, although that's a correlation, so who knows. Assuming that it's in, it's in part inheritab inheritability, it doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's just the genes, because it could be due, the fact that it's partially inherited from the mother to the child may be due to epigenetic factors, i.e., uh, the in utero conditions that affect the uh, um, development of the child might affect the height of this child as well as the height of the children of this child. Because at the same time that whatever your, the expression of your genes determines your own height, it also determines how your reproductive cell will uh, form, whether on, both for boys and for girls, and hence your, how we, your own children how tall your own children will be. So this is my picture. Uh, not a picture of, of children, but a picture of, of uh, mice, which uh, makes this point. Uh, on the right is a normal m mouse, a little brown mouse. If you starve this little brown mou uh, mouse during uh, pregnancy, uh, some of their offspring might become yellow. Um, that's because of uh, the, uh, the methylation the, the, the process of the, 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 the gene formation is changed, that's, and the mouse is, that mouse becomes yellow and obese, uh, which is another like a paradoxical uh, form effect of malnutrition. But the children of this mouse will also be yellow, although this can be corrected by feeding this mouse very well. So that's the, the, the way in which the interaction, the, the, the continue to be an interaction between your history. So the history of your parents, there's no impact of the genes. You have to, mice are all the same, but the, the history of your parents continue to affect the, his, the, the future of your own children, although that, be, that can be corrected by a lot of love and care. Which means that, to some extent, the fact, suppose that it is true that in the NFHS, the rich kids are, uh, are shorter, then it could still be that they are still catching up uh, from, uh, from processes before, and there is no difference in the genetic pool. I think in, uh, you see that, actually, that the, uh, when people migrate, it's the children are still smaller, and the grandchildren start to catch up. Which suggests, if you're interested in going in this direction, one uh, sort of potentially uh, uh, testable prediction, along, very much along the line of what you're doing here, which is that if you know the birth order of the mother, I don't know whether it's in the DHS or not, then we should find that children of moms who are themselves higher order, birth order should be uh, smaller, controlling for the child's own birth order. Uh, so that would potentially be interested. And potentially, the gradient of your own birth order should be stronger because the good nutrition in utero will be more important for someone who starts with a disadvantage. So that's sort of something that I just, like, maybe it's not at all where you want to go, but that's a potential interesting setup for thinking about t testing in larger population this epi epigenetic stuff. Uh, let me spend just one minute on, uh, on something that I was less uh, clear about, which is the, the, uh, the, 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 the theory. Something that I don't understand in the theory is that I uh, su suppose that it does suggest a steeper gradient. It's still the case that if you have higher, if you have fewer kids, you have more to spend on them. So there is a very strong first order effect that the gradient is going to be steeper, but they're all going to be above, uh, higher unless I missed something. And so we're left back to explain then why is the first Indian kid doing not much better than the first African kid. And then even though the gradient is steeper, even the second kid should sort of be at the same level. So that I didn't, I didn't see this, this force. The model uh, starts from the presumption that people know what they are doing when they are not feeding pregnant women. So it's very explicit in the paper that it's about 
uh, uh, it's uh, you're try really trying to see to say that it's it's about investment in the child through investment in the pregnant mother. You feed more the pregnant mo mother because you like the first child more. So even though it goes through the mother, it's still about the child. I I wonder whether we really know that, and whether in particular whether we know that from the data. Uh, in that it is possible that people do not know what they are doing. Here's some uh, uh, anecdotal evidence that is uh, overused, but I'm still going to uh, use it nonetheless. Is this uh, CWA report in Gujarat looking at uh, why people are not feeding uh, the pregnant woman, citing two theories which both go in the direction that if for the good of the child, they shouldn't, you shouldn't feed the pregnant woman. Uh, one of them is that it's not good if the child is too big because it's going to be very difficult for it to, for him or her to get out. The second, which is more uh, interesting, is that if you eat too much, you take, you crowd out the space for the child. So you shouldn't, the mother shouldn't eat too, so much so that the child has the has the space to develop. So I've heard, actually we've heard this 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 as well. So these ideas might be that. In fact, they are trying to do the best they can for the child at the expense of the mother that they couldn't care less about. So it may be an unintended effect of discriminating against the woman in, uh, in uh, uh, favor of the child. And one, uh, one thing that could, that could potentially explain the gradient because a lot of women go home for their first child. And I, I was trying to say what is a lot. Maybe it's not true at all, but maybe it's just like, uh, so I was trying to get a number for that, but I, maybe you find one, maybe it's not true, but I suppose it's true that people go home in advance of delivering their first child. Then I go home to their parents who are going to feed them because I like them. And so the first child is going to, to, you know, the, to do much better out of that. Then they come back for the second and third child where they are with their mother-in-law who doesn't like them and doesn't feed them and is caring about, potentially caring about the kid but not understanding the link between the two. So it is possible that the, 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 the one versus everybody else uh, comes in part from that. Of course, that wouldn't explain the two versus three, although it is possible that people are, you know, the woman gets less and less at attention as she gets more kids, uh, but maybe that's just the same fact uh, said again. Well, let me let me let me stop here. But again, it's like just really fantastic. Uh, fantastic paper when it starts with a fact like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So I think we have about five minutes for questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if uh, if there's any measure of total caloric intake uh, from these DHS surveys based on household consumption of food that might help, um, you know, uh, sort of inform your, your analysis and your model. But also, um, cultural ethnic prevalence rates in general um, in these countries, because that those might account for, and you might have already done this, but those might account for the birth spacing, because they tend to be higher um, in in some African setting that they are in South Asia, uh, but let use it. And so, whether you would help it for those and, um, or s within this model or separately as well. And just to follow up on that, related to this point about the budget constraints, you know, if there was a different equivalent scale within for India, that somehow there's more economies of scale in Africa than there are in India, that would get you everything you wanted. Don't, uh, um, so we maybe we'll just take one question back to the I am now signing um, from the evidence section. I actually wanted to say something in contrast to this emphasis on the budget constraints. I think some epidemiologists would tell you you can overstate that because a lot of the story about what's happening in utero has to do with cortisol and stress that women are exposed to that can be a result of infectious diseases, but can also be the result of other environmental effects. So the extent that that's part of the story of what's going on, it's not something that's going to be resolved by understanding something about the budget constraints that you have to spread among the family members. So there are like historical studies that have been done on that subject that have shown that So there's like historical data on that set, for example, from the US when you look at heights amongst men during the first world war period. 
you may want to take this up. Yeah, let me take uh, these questions and, and uh, thank you, Esther, for the uh, comments. I'll, I'll uh, mention, respond to some of them and talk to you afterwards about some. So that, um, <coughs> in terms of total caloric intake, there, uh, Esther alluded to we, there isn't in the DHS caloric intake. There are some indicators for whether you ate some categories. And so we do see this decline in the of proper foods across pregnancies of Indian mothers versus mothers, Indian mothers versus African mothers. But it isn't the rich data you really want for caloric intake. In terms of birth spacing, it's actually very quite similar uh, to, uh, across India and Africa. And this is like, you know, there are two tendons and others, you know, with more fertility, you might expect shorter birth spacing, but people think there's might be higher birth spacing. They're slightly, um, slightly, we can control for birth spacing. You know, that's probably dicey uh, econometrically, but in terms of is that quantitatively enough to, uh, to explain it, and uh, it, it doesn't. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, so that what isn't in the presentation or even in the paper is like a bunch of other explanations that people have suggested to us that we thought about, can we empirically do these have bite? So Ben mentioned one of them, which is economies of scale. So I think a lot of people have, uh, have suggested to us that in Africa there's more a communal way of raising children or mothers pass one of their children off to a, a family member, so the effective family size is smaller in Africa versus so we can, in all those cases, no perfect way to empirically test them. We can use uh, variation across primary sampling units of like a rate of fostering, and does that you know, explain the gradients? And empirically, it doesn't. So I, I think we're well aware that those aren't, uh, you know, that, that's that's not a perfect way of testing it. But insofar that that would have the prediction that the prevalence of fostering would make things look better in Africa, uh, they don't. I think in terms of another one that has been mentioned to us is land scarcity in terms of why you would. Uh, that there's more land scarcity in India versus Africa, and so that might be why there's a that might be the kind of deep reason that underlies a preference for the firstborn kid because that you're going to give all give all of your land to the firstborn in India, whereas in Africa there's uh, more plentiful land. And so we use cross country within Africa. There's some nice measures of land scarcity, and that force doesn't seem to explain the, the patterns uh, across Africa. You know, which I think we're very open to other ideas and. Uh, uh, um, so we tried to empirically test the ones we can. In terms of some of um, uh, Esther's uh, suggestions, you know, I think we've, I think epigenetics is the way out. If you know, in terms of if you wanted to lean on genetics, but I think you're right that it, it has many of the same policy implications. So I think the extreme view is that we should. This isn't a problem because you know it's the kind of height variation that wouldn't correlate with like the, you know, the, the political argument for why why it's if it's genetics, it's not correlated with later high health or later education, I think the epigenetics argument still has many of the same uh, implications uh, that you know, I think we think are important in terms of public policy can improve that. But uh, we don't talk about it in the paper, we should probably, you know, I think we didn't want, we didn't know enough to, to we didn't want to say something wrong, but I do think we should probably be more explicit about that. In terms of the, um, you know, I think in terms of the natal village, I, you know, I, I also think that can explain the first versus Second, I think we were left thinking, you know, and I mean, maybe there's no single explanation, but in terms of we still see as big of a drop off between the second verse and the third verse, and at least in like the places I've seen, there is a very high prevalence of being birthed in your natal village in the first birth, but it drops, you know, close to zero for the second and, and, and third. But that can certainly be part of the first versus uh, later born kid. And in terms of the birth order of the um, the mother, I think it's a great suggestion. It's something we had. Uh, we thought about, and there are these sibling surveys from the DHSs. They're not for India, so the uh, and they're not for many countries. But there are some to, to measure maternal mortality. They asked about siblings, and so you can kind of back out the, the birth order among girls in a, a, a family. But uh, you know, we would love for that to exist in India to, to look at it. But if anyone knows other data sets where you could know the birth order of a, an adult, that would be fantastic. Um, 